Okay, I, I hope everybody can see the screen. Yep. And we have a, a lot of uh, bills that are going on right now. The legislative session is going on and a lot of bills are gonna be impacting our environment here. Here I listed four that we consider very, very important. One is, uh, doesn't affect this directly down here, but is the cancel the Amcori's toll roads that are coming in. And that looks like it's gonna move forward. We think probably the most important one for the whole state is uh, fully fund uh, Florida Forever at $300 million, like it was for about 10 years previous to uh, Governor Scott. And uh, we need to protect the regional planning councils. That's an important issue. And we uh, must stop uh, Senate Bill 1504 and House Bill 1133 that allow expansion of seawalls and armoring along the coastline. And we'd like to have you uh, contact our representatives, which is Senator uh, Debbie Mayfield and Representative Aaron Grow. Uh, these are our four top priorities. Uh, we're going to be sending out alerts via email to contact them. And we like to have you contact two or three other people that are friends of yours to encourage them to, uh, to do the same. Um, we also have are offering a uh, trip to Cuba. Uh, my wife and I did this uh, a few years ago and it was one of the best trips we've ever taken as far as birding goes. The environment in Cuba is really quite good. They've been a relatively poor country and they have not just gone crazy in development and roads and things. So uh, it is only is limited to eight participants. Um, if the, the first trip is almost uh, filled up, but we're planning if you're interested to get a second trip and uh, contact our office uh, if you're interested. You're going to see a lot of unique birds there in Cuba. It's, uh, it's, it's a fairly unique and, you, and it's so close and you hear so much about Cuba, but it's kind of nice to see for yourself what it's like. Our Audubon Advocates is going strong. Uh, Megan Carpenter is doing a great job leading the uh, Audubon Advocates program and is, is now going to schools herself. Before we were doing it uh, via uh, videos, but now we're uh, actually there and leading the kid, kid with the kids at the schools. We still have a lot of um, great uh, videos that you can get online to see. Uh, this one, uh, Nate and I put together is only talks about the Blue Cypress Lake and there's a lot of um, offspray mating out there. So it's a good thing to go. This is really a great place to visit to see uh, probably the largest population of offspray in the world. This, you know, we're right in the mitigation, mitigation, migration, excuse me, we're in mitigation too, but migration. Uh, with uh, all our birds passing through. And this is, I think, one of the best videos showing locally in Indian River County in the Treasure Coast, the best spots to go finding migratory birds. It's done by two of our best uh, local uh, birders and they've done a terrific job in telling you where to go to see the birds. We have, we had two field trips. One was on March 3rd, this is gone. And this one is going out to the Wakahachi wetlands and uh, uh, Green K. This is uh, led by Bill Loftus. Fantastic trip. It, it meets early. You have to go at uh, the Knights Inn out on uh, Route 60 uh, to get on. Registration is required and the trip is limited to 10 people. Uh, so there's not very many and it's probably filling up pretty soon. So it's, it's a great place to go uh, in a great trip. And Bill does a terrific job. We also have uh, Doug Tellme online uh, in a video. And he's probably one of the best people to tell you what plants are best for birds. Um, we, this kind of is a press release we put out. You don't have to go to Mars. Uh, we can see a, a lifeless Mars almost on our Earth, but let's plant more trees so it doesn't happen. We've got about 40 different species of trees. We're giving away. Um, live oaks free. We have lots of them, which is really the best bird, the best plant, best tree for uh, birds. It's uh, around over 400 species in our county. 
this is a list of some of them that we have. And we're selling the other plants for just $5 for a one gallon pot. Um, these are some of the trees and shrubs that we have and we're, we are uh, putting them on a map and so the GPS so you can tell where our plant, every tree is now on a map uh, on the state of Florida. Uh, we have given away or sold uh, over 4,000 uh, native plants of 30 species, uh, and we have them mapped where they've gone to. Uh, we're, so we've given out over 6,000, we're heading towards 7,000 uh, native plants that we've done in the last two years. I'm gonna try to do 100,000 in the next 10 or 15 years, but that's a big thing. I think we'll be happy to get to 10. <laughs> We are also wanting a lot of volunteers in the office, uh, maintenance, landscaping, leading field trips, fundraising, publicity, trail maintenance, uh, work together. We also have a, uh, a small uh, store online. It's not available to, to come to the office anymore. You can buy uh, the Blue Cypress book and Florida Birds Exposed. Uh, the Indian uh, River Lagoon and environmental history of that, which is a great book. And then the t-shirts we have. We have our library. Uh, we're still carrying on our bird of the month. And this month was the blue headed vireo, bringing home nature. This is Becky Loftus, Scott did a terrific bird here, the blue headed vireo. So submit your great photos for getting on the cover of our telegram which is our newsletter. We're, tonight's is our annual meeting and we honor our, our honorees and give our awardees. And the first one here is to Bonnie Swanson, uh, a special service award for outstanding efforts. She's done a fantastic job in getting kids outdoors. And uh, work, she's working really hard now to make Pelican Island Elementary School a uh, conservation or environmental school. And she's, uh, it's gonna be uh, one of the things we've put some grants in for funding. And she's been a very good organizer. She's a former principal of our schools. And so she knows the school system very well. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Uh, our board member of the year is Steve Goff. He is our treasurer. He keeps our books, prepares our budgets uh, for our board and many of the grant applications and also leads great field trips. Steve, I hope you're on. Conservation of the year goes to George Glenn. Uh, he's our corresponding secretary and does so many things. He's really pushing for us to get uh, the Florida forever back. He helped stop the Sebastian anne annexation and he leads great field trips too, and uh, is one of our uh, great board members. So we appreciate all the great work you do, George. This is an interesting award. It's to an environmental citizen. He, uh, to Bruce Sabo, who investigated the lead in old paint on the Sebastian River Railroad Bridge. They're replacing the bridge for that new uh, super 100 mile per hour train that's coming down, they had to put a new bridge in, but he's discovered that the old paint on that bridge is full of lead and it's contaminating our lagoon. And he's got the Florida Department of Natural, uh, the Florida Department Environmental Protection to uh, make the East Coast Railroad to finally take this seriously and realize that we have a serious problem of all this paint flacking off into the lagoon and how they're gonna dismantle that thing is really quite critical. So. Thank you very much, Bruce. And this is a, a conservation journalist. Um, I don't know how many people get to read the hometown news, but Mike Winnikoff has been doing a terrific job for the environment, informing our citizens the importance of the environmental issues in our county. And we think you're doing a terrific job in keeping the citizens uh, knowledgeable of what's going on. And we appreciate your work very much, Mike. Thank you. The environmental landscaping is going to Beth Powell. Beth uh, is uh, really the second in command of all our parks in Indian River County and our conservation lands. 
And she's been working really hard upgrading our county with uh, putting in native plants, Jones, Jones's Pyrrhus, where they got rid of a, a uh, uh, orange grove and now I planted back with uh, native plants and doing a terrific job there. She's been very good about removing invasives from our conservation lands. We have a lot of them and they're really a big problem. And what I liked really recently is she's got really new signage on all our conservation areas that people can go there, see what's there and enjoy them. Before a lot of them didn't have any uh, notice that there was a, a conservation land there. So thank you very much, Beth. President Wards goes to Graham Cox, Dr. Graham Cox. And, and this is my special award because it's the president's award. And he has been doing an outstanding job in writing great grants and being successful in getting them funded. And he's been working really hard, many hours during the day. And another thing that I like about Graham is that he keeps us informed. Uh, he's a, a big reader of newspapers, uh, magazines, and environmental issues, and keeps us all informed about what's going on in the world, in, in the United States, and in Florida. We appreciate, Graham, all the work that you do there. Thank you. And in fact, you look a little bit better than this picture, you know. In the <laughs> that was a bad life. <laughs> And here we have a special recognition award and Dee Fairbanks, uh, which is, and is the wife of David Simpson. You see David in the background here, but Dee, a great birder in herself, um, has led the South Bavard County Christmas bird count for nine years. Uh, this is the, the best data showing that we do have climate change. So the Christmas bird counts have been very, very important showing that you know, we have a serious problem in this earth uh, with uh, global change because the populations of the birds are really dwindling fast, especially among the migratory birds. And D, you've done a terrific job in getting the Christmas bird count, getting people to join in and uh, keep track of the birds in, in the, the Bav South Bavard Christmas bird count for, for nine years. The Volunteer of the Year Award, which is a new award that we're just giving out, is going to Barbara Ribe. I and mean, I don't think she's on. Unfortunately, she is in the hospital with pneumonia. We were very suspicious that maybe she had COVID. We're not sure but she's gotten sicker and sicker and sicker. And so finally she went to the emergency and they put her in the hospital. We're hoping that she recovers. She has been a really outstanding person. She's in charge of our nursery, uh, knows our plants really well and spends almost every day coming down to ra raise our plants and uh, grow our plants, talk about our plants to people who come by uh, is a fantastic uh, volunteer for us. And she's been doing this for many, many years. She also, uh, in her development, has uh, some native garden, is getting people there to plant native gardens. And so she's going, not just volunteering for us, but she's volunteering for other organizations too. Now, the next award is our second Environmental Citizens Award. And this is Peter Hinnick who uh, is promoting very healthy water environments. And so I'm gonna try, if you can help me, uh, Mary, put on uh, a four minute video that he has related to two ponds in, in uh, Sebastian. Back at the lake off of Schumann Drive, where I filmed about two months ago about the, uh, the algae. What I want to do today is do a little comparison of what a lake looks like that has been sprayed and what a lake looks like that hasn't been sprayed. So this is the Schumann Lake, I'd call it. And as you can see, a lot of dead vegetation from what they sprayed. And they might have sprayed again. I'm not sure if they, they sprayed a second time around the lake. And what I see, I didn't see any vegetation growing in the lake or around the edges. It's pretty much all dead. 
Also, I noticed the algae is still there. It's still growing. You have a little blanket on the windward side. You know, you'll, you'll see the algae. And um, that's because there's no plant life in there to absorb the nutrients. The only thing that can grow is the algae right now. So um, the people that do spray say it's, it's, you got to have to spray. And what I've heard, you got to spray because the vegetation will take over the lake. And also they say that it's, the vegetation will block the view of the lake. So they sprayed it, they killed the vegetation, but what I really don't understand, they left all the dead vegetation along the shoreline. And that eventually will die, decay, and turn into muck, which we know, everybody knows is a bad thing. So if you're gonna spray, you're gonna kill it, you need to take it out. Now here's a lake in the Sebastian area, no more than 10 minutes from this lake. This lake has not been sprayed. It has a lot of vegetation around the edges. There's vegetation covering, oh, I'd, I'd say a good quarter of the lake is covered in vegetation. But look at the water quality versus the water quality at the lake in Schumann. You see a big difference in water quality. Also, I notice there's wildlife in this lake. And yeah, guess what? You, it's harder to see the lake but what I see, I like. I see nature, I see vegetation, I see, to looks to me, healthier water. So this lake has not been sprayed. Of course, they say this is a bad thing. You got vegetation, you got, you got, you got plant life all going around the edges and this could be dangerous is what they're telling me. It doesn't make sense to me. And what I'm asking you all to comment on this video Decide for yourself what makes sense to you. Just don't listen to your government officials when they say, this is a bad thing. And then they'll turn around and tell you, this is a good thing. Look for yourself. What does your heart tell you? And what does your gut tell you? They tell you, spraying is good. We have to have it. Look at the results after two months. And then, now, look at the results if we didn't do anything. That's why I do these videos. I want you all to be aware. Look around. See what's going on in your, in your homeowner associations. Look what's happening in your local governments, your state government, and your federal governments. And don't be afraid to speak up. It's us that's going to have to change things. Yeah, it's, it's us. The government's not going to change things. We will change things. So take a look. Find a lake that hasn't been sprayed in your area and compare it to a lake that has been sprayed to your area. A canal that hasn't been sprayed versus a canal that has been sprayed in your area. Take a look for yourself and you decide. Nobody can do a better job at cleaning up what's going on here than Mother Nature. This isn't our land. It's Mother Nature's land and she could take it back at any time. So we need to help Mother Nature that she can clean this up herself because nobody can do it better than her. So that's enough of my ranting and raving. This is Pete Hink. Till next time, we'll see you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. I appreciate that. And he's got, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 more videos, not all on conservation, but he's starting to uh, to develop more and uh, I think we'll be able to appreciate that. The next is our birds and flies uh, with Diane Goldberg, who uh, is going to be our, our keynote speaker tonight. But I wanted to tell you a little bit more about her. Uh, she's a fantastic woman and she's, you should go see her yard. It's very native and very nice. But the Port St. Lucie Neighborhood of Services Department cited uh, Diane Yard for having high grass and weeds over 12 inches tall in a violation of city codes. It actually went to court. And if you look at the picture I got here, over on the right side of the judge's uh, table there, you see a bunch of 12 inch tall flowers that came from her yard, which she gave to the judge. 
and <coughs> I think that, that helped influence him. I think she had about 30 people, including our Pelican Island Audubon Society, write letters in support of her. But he ruled that uh, the high grass and weeds are Florida friendly flowers and are legal. And he's totally right. So if you're growing Florida friendly flowers, they cannot do anything to get you to cut them down. You don't have to cut them like you do your yard. So I was quite impressed with that. Uh, Diane, we're going to give Diane Goldberg the Environmental Educator of the Award tonight. And she has done a terrific job in not only educating the judge and some of the people around, but she's uh, a member of the, uh, is it the Martin County? No, uh, Audubon Society and also the Native Plant Society and a couple of other organizations. She raises a lot of native plants herself. And uh, she's one of the best educators uh, I know of the value of native um, plants. So without any further ado, if you want to take over. I'll let people know that um, I am a master gardener, a master naturalist. I'm the conservation chair for St. Lucie Audubon, liaison to Conservation Alliance and Rivers Coalition. Um, I have taken um, classes um, for on native plants, college courses, uh, audited them. And um, so I think I do know a lot and, but not everything. We're always all learning and there's always something new to learn. So this is a picture of baby birds that I have had in my yard. And I do um, have a marsh behind my house and a canal on the north side of the house. So I do have a lot of um, uh, birds that like the water as well as those that are terrestrial. Now here, notice that I'm going to be talking about butterflies and moths because if you went to Doug Tallamy's lecture, you know how important the moths are for our birds also. Uh, when we talk about the butterflies and note that some bird um, of the moths are out during the day too and they are beautiful and I'll show you some pictures of them. So, you know, um, a lot of your plants that you put in do need to be in the sun if you want the butterflies because that's where they prefer it. Uh, we're not gonna really talk about the water for the butterflies and puddling because there's so much water around where we live that it's not necessary. But shelter, they will shelter under leaves from shrubs and trees and the very tiny moths um, will shelter even under the leaves of ground cover. And we'll be talking about some of those plants too. But we're gonna mostly talk about the food for the caterpillars and that's the larval stage of the butterflies and moths. And we'll also talk about the nectar plant for the adult moths and butterflies. Now there are some things that you cannot do and because butterflies and moths are insects after all, uh, we cannot use insecticides, soaps, or oils at all because we'll kill them along with the bugs that you don't want. But that's one of the nice things about using native plants because they can take the inundation from the insects without being harmed. And then you're leaving it to the birds, wasps, and other wildlife to eat the caterpillars and butterflies and moths and other insects to keep the ecosystem in balance. So you will never have really too many of anything. They'll take care of it for you. Now that's for the most part. There are a few problems, but very few, like with our red bays, where we have brought in some plants that have uh, had um, insects and diseases that have been brought in with them that occasionally, very few times though, will affect a native plant um, to the point that the plants will die. And that's what's happened to our red bays. 
And because they are in the same family as avocados, the University of Florida and other scientists are working on um, trying to uh, take care of the problem. Now insects are the structural and functional base of many world ecosystems. And their study said that butterflies, moths, bees, and wasps are among the species most affected by habitat loss due to intensive agriculture, urbanization, pollution, and climate change that makes uh, them and other insects at risk of extinction over the next several decades. And to slow or halt the decline, a serious reduction in the use of pesticides is needed. In my yard, the only pesticide I use is a granule bait for fire ants. And you're putting it down only on the nest, not on the whole yard. You also don't want to use herbicides. Many herbicides have links to mammalian cancer, that's us, um, and developmental deformities, endocrine disruption, and more. Atrazine is a chlorinated pesticide in the water and is implicated in amphibian decline and human toxicity in our drinking water. Monarch butterflies are in decline due to the weed killer Roundup and is also associated with cancer in humans. And you'll see here the, the upper left is one of the moths that I get in my yard. Isn't that gorgeous? And so is the one on the lower left. And then you have our butterflies and you still wanna worry about um, our tree frogs too. I think they're adorable. And they eat a lot of the insects that you don't want. Butterflies and birds are indicator species of the health of our environment. And the University of Miami study shows that a decline of 60% of butterflies and caterpillars. Um, so we need to do uh, help them. Now, all of these pictures are from my yard, except for the one on the lower left. And the reason I put this picture in is because I had this moth in my yard. And it's, look at the size of it compared to these um, little warblers. So um, I was standing by my Barbados cherry tree, picking some cherries, and in flies a juvenile cardinal, grabs that moth up. And that's why I took this picture, because uh, I wasn't available to have a camera on what was happening at the moment. And he flies off to the left with his, the adult uh, male following close behind, takes a look at me, and he was only a foot away from me, and flies to the right to try and distract me from his young. And that was really neat. And in a moment, um, uh, I will tell you more about these model ducks that came up to lay eggs on my property. But you can see the diversity I get in my yard because I have a bird bath. And for those of you who might live in a homeowner's association that doesn't allow bird feeders, you'll find that you get more variety of birds with a bird bath than you do with the feeder. You do need to wash and brush it out at least twice a week. And sometimes they use it so much that you'll have to even uh, put more water in it the next day. Now, Leonard Perry from the University of Vermont says that 96% of terrestrial bird species depend on insects and lots of them. Gardeners should increase native plants to 75% to increase the number of bird species and overall number of birds. And diversity breeds diversity. It is a love triangle of sorts. Uh, both um, between plants, insects, and birds, says Rionin Crane from a Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So um, I suggest if you want to see the variety is put in a bird bath somewhere by a window where you'll be able to see it whenever you're in the house. Well, I get a variety of other wildlife too. And I wanted to talk about this raccoon, which I don't see very often in my yard, but he seems to know when the turtles and ducks come up to lay their eggs. 
and he did eat quite a number um, from both species, but he didn't eat all of them. That's the balance we're talking about. We don't want too much of any one species. And so even though the turtle eggs were eaten, I know that they didn't all get eaten because one of got them got strayed and got under the screen door and into my swimming pool. We were able to save him and get him down into the marsh, but I'm hoping there were a lot more than just this one. And with the model ducks, there were six ducklings um, later that were brought down by its parents to the marsh too. So it was really enjoyable to see. Unfortunately, this squirrel did not survive because I do get red-shouldered hawks. And unfortunately, uh, one of them ate the squirrel. But he must have been an ag aggressive squirrel because I only had the one squirrel. And since he's left, I now have a pair. The monoculture of grass lawns requires lots of water, fertilizer, pesticides, and herbicides, which are not good for our waterways, climate change, or our health. And we need to know that it is no longer prestigious to have that monoculture. We want to see more diversity either in with the grass or pull out more of the grass and have more flower beds, trees, and shrubs. Um, you want to layer it like you see in this picture on the lower right, where you have all different um, plants in all layers. And it really is easier to take care of. You're not spending the money on um, all of the things that have to be put on the grass and doing all the trimming yourself or paying to hire someone to do that. So native plants when put in the right place, meaning if the, uh, a plant likes a dry area, that's where you put it and full sun if that's what it wants versus wetland plants, um, like one of the ones on your list, the button bush likes wet feet you need to put them in, in the place that is right for them. And then you have very little work to take care of them. They won't need any or very little uh, fertilizer, um, very little water, and can sustain up the inundation of insects, like I said. This, then they won't be stressed out where the insects will affect them. This helps keep nutrients and other pollutants from washing down into our storm drains, canals, and into waterways such as the St. Lucie River and Indian River Lagoon. The native trees and shrubs also sequester carbon into the ground, which helps with climate change and lowers the acidification of our ocean. And remember that again, when we kill insects, we are killing our pollinator. So that's talking about our food supply. The acidification of our ocean means killing our coral reefs and seagrasses. And that's important because this is where fish spawn and the juveniles live. And that's also a problem with our food supply. So it does affect everyone. You don't have to live right on the water to, for it to affect you. Climate change means sea level rise, which causes saltwater intrusion in our shallow aquifers, also causing hotter weather, more hurricanes, extreme floods and droughts, harm to us, our food supply and drinking water again, and waterways and to wildlife. And these are pictures from the back of my house over on the marsh. And the lower left that, if you look closely, is two otters, not one, and they were mating. We'll talk a little about now the foods for the caterpillars and each needs specific plants. So if there's a particular butterfly you're looking for, then you're going to want to mark down the name of the plant that you want for it. 
Um, if you've seen Doug Tallamy's lecture, he talked about this website from the National Wildlife Federation, and it will list, you put in your zip code, and it will provide you the uh, name of the woody plants or herbaceous plants that are available or native to your area where you live um, for your county, not just your zip code. And as you see, oaks, you can have as many as 395 different species of caterpillar. And the, you know, I listed a few of the ones that I like the best, both um, butterflies and moths. Roadside planting of trees reduce the nearby indoor air pollution by as much as 50%. So do use the woody plants, you do want to use trees. And the University of Florida says you should group three different types of trees together and their root system will um, work together to support each other so that they won't go down during storms and hurricanes. So don't just put in one tree, you want three. So here is um, some trees and butterflies and even a moth, this lower right moth is beautiful. So you would want uh, to put in your um, oaks and willows and pines, um, maples, hickory, whatever you feel um, is right for your location. Maples, you do need to do a locate to make sure there are no pipes um, because their root system search out for water and can break pipes. Trees are natural filters of air, groundwater. They can remove carbon dioxide and pollutants from the environment. A single tree can absorb 26 pounds of carbon dioxide per year. And that's from a column from Cara Cloud Bailey, who does uh, a weekly um, column. Um, and Auburn University study says energy costs are reduced by up to 11% for just 17% of the home shaded by a tree. So there's another reason that it would be a good idea for you to have trees. I have over 20 trees in my yard on all sides of the house. And I just recently got one of these hackberries, also called sugarberries, because I've learned that not only will it host 43 different caterpillars, the birds like to eat the berries, but I haven't gotten any berries yet. It's still too young. And please note that this is deciduous. That means it loses its leaves in the winter. So don't throw it away thinking that it's dead. And look at this Io moth in the middle, these two. The male is this ivory one, and that's very neat and very different for them to be so different from each other. These are all moths. And look how beautiful they are. And I get most of them. And um, the tiger, the nace tiger moth, all you need to do is put in some violets, and that makes a great ground cover, um, as well as hosting 19 different caterpillars. Um, then uh, for the bald cypress, you will get this giant leopard moth on the lower um, left. Uh, then also this uh, imperial moth on the upper right. It's fabulous. Pines also, I have the um, Gallberry, holly, elderberry, mulberry. Do you think it's a lot? It doesn't seem like too much to me and you're welcome to come and see. I even have the blackberry and have had seen in my yard this uh, white line phoenix while I was working on the ground landed on my arm. <laughs> it was really neat. Sunshine and Morsa is also a wonderful ground cover. It will grow in with your grass or instead of the grass. 
you can still mow the grass and the mimosa will be fine. I wanted you to see here that this little yellow looks different uh, when the wings are open, uh, the picture on the lower left, to when the wings are closed and you can see that over in the middle, um, upper middle. Um, the mimosa yellow looks very similar, only larger. Unfortunately, the picture of the white um, lines, uh, angled moth doesn't show up well on the PowerPoint, uh, but it really is pretty too. Bog fruit is another wonderful ground cover. Same thing, if you can grow it in with your grass or instead of the grass. And it is a host plant for five different butterflies. So this is one of my favorites. And I really love this white peacock that you see on the upper right because it will be in your yard all year long, whereas the other butterflies are more seasonal. Well, this gives you just an idea of how many different plants I have. And this isn't even all of them, but just to show you how, what the variety of caterpillars are, and I probably haven't seen them all either. And this shows you examples of both the butterflies and moths that, I, that come. So it's really neat. Uh, most people want the monarchs. And even though we do have 21 different species of milkweed that will grow here in Florida, um, many of them are native to North Florida, and then there are some that are not native at all. We have at least four, though, that you can plant that are neighbor, uh, the, um, that are native to, to um, Indian River County, and that would be the tuberosa, this upper right picture. Uh, the world milkweed, and there are two wetland uh, milkweeds, uh, a white and a pink. Now, the non-native, if you can't find the natives, um, uh, do grow all year long, and you need to cut them down in the winter so that the um, butterflies don't get a parasite from the plants our natives will die back in the winter and will often come back up. Um, but you have to keep watering it during the winter, even though you don't see the plant there in order for it to grow back. Now, this is the life cycle of the monarch. Um, and you can't even see, you can see my arrow on the upper left, that is an egg. That's how, how tiny the eggs are. So the caterpillars are that tiny too. Um, they, caterpillars will molt numerous times until they form their chrysalis. And in moths, it's called cocoons. Now the cocoons are sometimes um, built on the underside of leaves, but many of them, uh, the caterpillars drop down to the ground and make their cocoons underground. So um, here on the upper right, you could see that the caterpillars are forming their chrysalis and below it, that's what that pretty chrysalis looks like. When they start turning dark, that means that they are ready to come out, never help them out, otherwise they won't be strong enough to survive. And then they'll stay a couple of hours pumping fluids through their wings before they can fly off. The queens and soldiers also like the milkweed, but I wasn't getting them. So I put in a white twine vine and then they did come. So that was really neat. And they are in the same family as the milkweed. You could see that the flowers do look the same. Um, the giant swallowtail likes food in the citrus family. So you can use um, wild lime, Hercules club, and um, sea torchwood. The sea torchwood 
um, is soil tolerant. The uh, Hercules Club and the Wild Lime are both very thorny. The lower left and lower right is the Hercules Club. And it protects, the caterpillars protect themselves from being eaten by looking like bird poop. Uh, that giant swallowtail looks very different from when its wings are closed to when its wings are open. And not like the monarch, it lays numerous eggs all together on one leaf. This is one leaf. Black swallowtails like food in the carrot family and the mock viciousweed and water cowbine um, like moist locations. So this is not good for you if you don't have irrigation. Um, but I like to eat fennel and I planted it. And um, this butterfly did lay its eggs. I had cut a piece. I was bringing it into the house because I wanted to put some of the fennel in a salad. And it looked like it had a little dirt on it, these little flecks, and I um, brought it in. and thought something was wrong with my eyes because those dots seemed to be moving. So I took a magnifying glass to it and lo and behold, it was caterpillars. They were that tiny. And I put it in a vase of water and uh, let them have their way with the plant instead. Great Southern White likes pepper grass, limber caper, salt wart, and coastal sea rocket. And the last two are salt tolerant plants. The pepper grass is also called poor man's pepper and uh, pepper weed. Um, it is something that you can eat, all of it. That's what the early settlers did eat instead of using pepper since it had to be brought in from out of the country and was too expensive for them. The flowers, the seeds while they're green, the leaves and even the root can be eaten. It has a peppery flavor and the root tastes like a mild horseradish. But if you prefer, you can leave it for the butterflies. The, I could not get the limber caper to grow for me. I did plant it, but it likes a rich soil and I have a very sandy soil. And rather than improving the soil, it's best to put in the plants um, for the conditions you have. This one, if you do have a nice rich soil, blooms at night. It's the moths that pollinate it. And uh, you could see when the um, pods open up, it's this lovely uh, color and uh, you can enjoy that too. Hopefully you're better at uh, growing it than I was. Orange barred sulfur likes food in the Senna family. It used to be called cassia, and there are a number of different varieties. The cloudless sulfur also likes the senna, um, but it will also lay its eggs on the partridge pea and sensitive pea. Malachite likes the wild um, petunia, which also hosts the white peacock, common buckeye, and two different crescents. I probably just don't have enough wild petunia because I have not seen the malachite. Or maybe it's just because it's green so it blends in with the plants. But I do get lots of the Gulf fritillary on the passion vine. I used to have the purple, but it's short lived, meaning about four years and then it dies back. Whereas the corky stem, even though you don't have a beautiful flower, it's quite insignificant and quite small, you do have the berries that the birds just love. And they have spread that plant all over my yard. I have over six different plants now, and I don't mind that at all. And I'd be glad to share it with you too. And you can see that the Gulf fritillaries really like the female. But because um, the birds have spread the corky stem, I am now getting the zebra long wings also, which they prefer um, laying their eggs on plants that are in partial shade uh, or full shade. So, um, and the plant is also good for the Julia. 
red admirals like weedy plants, pillatory, false nettle, and nettles. The pillatory on the bottom left is also edible. So instead of getting rid of all of these, what is called weeds, is only a weed if it's in a place that you don't want it. Um, it tastes like cucumber and you can have some of it too. Painted Lady likes the cudweed, um, the plant all the way to the right. Uh, and so you, if you don't want to have that plant, you can't plant thistles and um, plants in the pea family. Suranus Blue looks so much like the Miami Blue Butterfly that the Fish and Wildlife Service have listed it as threatened. Now, look at the picture on the upper right, and I want you to see this eye, uh, uh, what is called an eye, on um, the Witten. And notice how there's the black and white edging on the blue side. And it's a beautiful shimmering blue, but it's very difficult to get a picture of it because it doesn't keep its wings open when it lands. It usually keeps them closed. Partridge pea, sensitive pea, uh, sunshine mimosa. Now there are native and non-native rattle boxes. So the, you want the native variety because there is one that's even invasive. Uh, the uh, rabbit bells also have native and non-native varieties. Um, Carolina indigo, I do have that. It's also called bastard indigo and it does lose its leaves in the winter. So don't pull it out because it takes a long time between before the leaves come back. Now notice the cassius blue and see that it has two eye spots and that's how you tell the difference. Also the edging isn't as strong as the Serranus. Um, and besides the plants in the pea family, um, it will also lay its eggs on the false tamarind, which is this upper right, and also the Dr. Bush, also called white plumbago, that's in the upper middle. White peacock, my favorite, uh, likes the fog fruit, wild petunia, and bacopa. But the pacopa is a wetlands plant, so you don't want to get it unless you have a moist area that's moist all year long. Common buckeye, as we talked before, likes the white uh, petunia, the wild petunia, toad flax, which is only an annual around for a few months, and plantains. And I'm not talking about bananas. It's this plant on the right. It's a ground cover that's also not only can only be around there for a few months. And that plant is edible and used to make medicine, um, but only before the flowering stem comes up. Then the leaves get too fibrous to eat. So on the lower um, left is your wild petunia. And here on the lower right is your twin flower. And you've already seen the fog fruit on the um, upper left. Atala butterfly. And I do think on your list, there are Kunti's for sale. Um, and this is a very unusual butterfly, quite pretty, though small. It will make its chrysalis on the same plant that it lays its eggs. And that is unusual. Most um, butterflies will go to another plant to make the chrysalis. Though I had somebody who told me that their monarchs do make their chrysalis on the milkweed only to find out that was the only plants he had in his whole yard. His yard was covered with milkweed. Now this plant was, this uh, butterfly was considered to have been uh, gone extinct. Um, and that's because they took all of or most of these plants out to um, build, make farms and build homes. 
but when uh, landscape companies started um, propagating them um, for sale for homes, the, they made a comeback. So it's been wonderful. I like the long tail skipper too. You have this beautiful blue through the middle of the body, but notice that the tails do break off. And they like the plants in the pea family and they come in lots of different colors. We're gonna talk about nectar plants also. If you're only going to do a small area for your butterfly garden, and of course for moths too, because as you saw, they're just beautiful too. You wanna to group the plants um, in groups of three or five, um, but don't use hybrids because they have little to no nectar. You want to use our um, natives, but the ones that have not hybridized. So here we have a picture of the Coreopsis leavenworthii. And um, you do also have the lance leaf for sale, but get one or the other, not both, because they will hybridize with each other. And we don't want to lose our native varieties. And besides being a wonderful nectar plant, it is host to five different um, moths. And this southern emerald, look how pretty it is, is one of them. Now you can see that I didn't just group them um, together. I put it in with the flea babe. Actually, nature did that because they decided to reseed in these places because these are annuals and I let them receive where they want. I don't go and collect up the seeds and then uh, put them in a specific spot because I have my whole yard to do this. I've taken out most of the grass all over the yard. And so um, th that's possible. Um, the mist flower, with all the different flowers I have, all year long, the monarch prefers uh, getting its nectar from the mist flower. This seems to be their favorite. Firebush is not only a wet nectar plant for your butterflies and moths, but also for hummingbirds. So this is a great plant to have, and it will also host three different phoenix moths, which are quite pretty. Um, porterweed, the native is the one that is a ground cover. It lays flat on the ground. The one that grows tall is the non-native. You're better off getting the native. Um, and I went to a lecture once on uh, edible plants and they taught me that you can eat these flowers. They taste like mushrooms. I'd rather leave it for the butterflies and moths and other pollinators and then I'll eat mushrooms that are real mushrooms. Salvia, the hummingbirds do like this red salvia, which flowers all year long, it is a long-lived annual and will reseed for you. If it grows too tall, just snap the tops off and throw the seeds on the ground so that you'll have more for the next year. This blue one um, and the flowers are often purple too, is a good ground cover. All the leaves are flat on the ground and just the flowering stem comes up about a foot. And you will find that um, this is also a host plant for six caterpillars besides being a nectar plant. Flower lantana, also called button sage, the birds like to eat the seeds and I've seen them go in and, and eat them and fight over them. Um, and again, besides being a nectar plant, it will host 14 different caterpillars. So this is a good plant that you can put under trees um, and around other bushes too. So you do want to layer. Uh, hibiscus prefers moist areas. Uh, so you have to at least have um, a sprinkler system if you'd like to have the hibiscus. The scarlet hibiscus is the red one and it will die back in the winter 
uh, and if you continue to keep the area wet, then it should come back for you or you can save the seeds to replant. Excellent plant, um, not only as a nectar plant, but host to 37 caterpillars. Goldenrod is one of the best herbaceous plants with a total of 82 caterpillars that it hosts, but the pollinators absolutely love it. Now, some people think that they're allergic to this plant, but uh, scientists and doctors say that you're not. It's just that our native ragweed blooms at the same time. And you have my permission to pull those out. Fleabane, one of my favorites, also just an annual, be around for several months. Um, and, and actually they started blooming last month but, um, uh, and they're bloom, so I have even more blooming this month. And next month, I should have lots of them. The last two years, they didn't bloom this much until May because it was a drier winter season. Um, to me, they look like little fried eggs. And look at this pearl crescent that it is a host to. The problems we're having with our environment are not new, though we think that's the case. Alfred Russell Wallace, the 19th century naturalist who developed a theory of evolution alongside Charles Darwin, wrote in an essay, future ages will certainly look back upon us as a people so immersed in the pursuit of wealth as to be blind to higher considerations. They will charge us with having culpably allowed the destruction of some of those records of creation, which we have it in our power to preserve. And he studied birds. So you can see that the problem may be worse now, but they were, it's been around for a long time. For, um, you should know about our Florida Friendly Landscape Ordinance to make sure that you don't have a problem with your city, county, or homeowners association. Um, this ordinance says that a deed restriction or covenant may not be prohibited or be enforced as to prohibit any property owner from implementing Florida Friendly Landscaping on his or her property or create any requirement or limitation in conflict with the provision. Uh, you still need to put in a requisition to your homeowners association um, before, to, to let them know what you want to plant before you can just go ahead and plant it. Um, and the local government ordinance may not prohibit or be enforced either to prohibit on uh, uh, landscaping for Florida friendly and the water districts were um, asked to help the cities and counties implement this with an incentive program um, to get them to adopt new ordinances or amend existing ordinances. So this is important that you should have a copy and be able to say, look, I'm in the right but you do need to know your plants to be able to say, no, this is a neighbor I, and I want it. So it's not a weed. Any plant that you want is not a weed. Um, you should have gotten this information so, uh, or will be getting this information. So you do want to look at the National Wildlife Federation's plant finder and put in your zip code, but it doesn't have all the pictures. I prefer to use the butterflies and moths of North America to check out the pictures of um, the butterflies and moths that you will be attracting. And before you go out and buy a plant, um, or you might see a plant at a, a nursery and say, oh, I'd like that. Well, you want to make sure that it is native to where you live, not just Florida, because it could be native to the Keys and won't grow well here, or native to North Florida. So you won't get the butterflies um, that it's supposed to attract. Um, and it will show you not only where it's native to, but if it's non-native or invasive, and will show you pictures of the plants. And then there are um, 
other websites that are helpful for you to help decide what plants to choose and some books that I use to make up this PowerPoint. Any questions? Um, Terry Green asked, does Diane have a rain garden area? Um, as she put in the chat, uh, she has, um, doesn't have a rain garden, but has wetland plants by the marsh. And I don't know if you want to speak further to that. <laughs> well, um, you know, if you're interested, if you have, let's say, runoff from your roof, then, you know, it, it is a good to either have a rain barrel to collect that, to use that water, um, or you can go ahead and um, make yourself a rain garden. And that is a wonderful thing to do. And we do have some wonderful natives for those areas like the bacopa, like irises, like the um, scarlet hibiscus. Um, these are all wonderful plants to have in your rain garden. Uh, there are, you know, quite a number of wetland plants that you can use. Um, I actually have a question, um, Diane, and I'll go ahead and put my, my video on. Hey, okay. so um, I am the main plant person um, at Audubon, uh, with the exception of Barbara Reby. Barbara Reby is definitely a top volunteer, but when people order plants, they talk to me. So I am learning about them. Um, and when you said like plant three um, of the same plant together, uh, can they be like, how, how far apart should they be? Well, that depends yeah, right. on the plant. Right. You know, if you're, let's say, putting in something like the blanket flower. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the blanket flower um, spread is about two feet. Okay, so you're going to, so that from the center stem is a foot, and so you want to plant it two feet apart because okay. the next one is going to be, uh, have that same spread. So you need that distance. Okay. Um, if you're planting something like wild petunias, um, you can just plant them um, about six inches away because they don't have that big spread, but they will reseed and you'll, you know, hopefully have more plants for future times. And that seed will spread over the um, area for you. So that'll be nice. Uh, take something like the horse mint and the horse mint is wonderful. Um, some varieties do taste minty, but the variety that I have and, and I don't know if it has just something to do with the soil because um, they're both the same species. Mine, when you crush a leaf, smells and uh, like oregano. If you let it dry, you can use the dry leaves as oregano substitute, which is wonderful in um, soups and salads on chicken. I mean, it's, it's wherever you would use um, oregano and tomato sauces. These are different things that you could use. Um, and it hosts seven different caterpillars and the flowers are quite pretty. Now their spread is more like four feet apart. So, um, and don't uh, pull it out when they start dying back just cut it back to the ground because very often it will regrow for the next season. So that's a nice plant and um, you'll get lots of seeds so you can use them in a lot of locations. Um, you know, again, um, if you're going to use the gamma grass, you know that becomes a, a quite big. So you know, you need to have the distance for them. Okay, thank you. I would say- I'd love to hear from people. Yes. But that's what we wanna do. We want to put in more native plants because that's what's healthy for our environment and for our wildlife. I was gonna say that if, and thank you very much for a fantastic talk. If every one of us did what Di uh, Diana Goldberg is doing for in her yard, if we would have yards, just even maybe 
50% or 25%, uh, we would not have global warming. We would have lots of birds. We'll have lots of butterflies. Uh, it'll be a total different world. This, uh, where we are now in planting turf and grass and no trees, maybe a palm or two, is really uh, very destructive. And there are really cost-free ways of solving this problem. And it would, it would cost you less money. You don't have to pay for somebody cutting, cut your grass. You don't have mowers and blowers waking up your neighbors. Uh, you're not putting a lot of CO2 out into the area. Uh, I mean, it's a fantastic opportunity. And I'm so glad that the judge ruled in your favor. And I hope they don't, the city of uh, doesn't give you any more hard problems. But maybe if they do, you get to advertise your stuff a little bit more. So it's very nice. Actually, I spoke to them last week and they had like um, an open house at a new park. And I went down there and I spoke to them and they told me that they weren't from neighborhood services, that they weren't going to bother me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope it is true. Right. And, and that's, uh, you've done a terrific job and that's why we wanted you to be our speaker tonight. One of the things you. that uh, we're, we are, we are giving away plants, native plants to all public places. So gardens. Uh, and one of the successes has been that the city of Vero Beach has removed all of their turf uh, and have pl planted in not all natives, but at least non turf and some natives. So we appreciate that. And uh, right. we are offering all our plants available to the public at a nominal cost. And if it's a public grants, they get the trees and plants all free. Thank you. So thank you. I think that wraps us up. And thank you all for attending. We had a pretty good number today, tonight, and uh, appreciate you all participation. Anything more? Thank you, Richard. Take care, Diane. I think we'll cut this off. Huh?